Okay, hello and welcome to another podcast episode of Raw Talks. Uh, we are Abundant Lifestyle Healing Center in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and we also work online. And today we have you, Mine, with us, the founder of Visionary Craniosacral Work. Finally got it right in the name. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what this work is all about and yeah, just to hear your story about how how this work came came to be, and I think a lot of the listeners might not know what it is as well, right? So this will be a really interesting episode for me. I had some experience with this modality, and yeah, it's changed my way of how I'm looking at body work uh, quite quite dramatically, actually. So welcome you. Thank you, Simba. Why don't you introduce yourself uh, so we can get to know who you are and, and we'll take it from there. I pronounce my name Hugh Milne. I trained as an osteopath in London, England, from a background of two prior generations of my family working in Scotland as naturopaths and osteopaths. And within osteopathy, there's a speciality called cranial osteopathy, which is working with the skull the spine and the pelvis and in the now 55 years or so that i've been paid to touch people it's slowly evolved from osteopathy to cranial osteopathy to what i call visionary craniosacral work and the word visionary is based on the teaching of the basque um, wise woman angeles arian who defined a, a visionary as someone who could see the parts see the whole, understand the client's psychological process and understand their own psychological process and treat all four as equal in importance. So visionary work is really about seeing who's here, seeing who's right in front of you in your treatment room, and then responding from what is hopefully a sufficiently deep tool bag to what that person wants and needs in terms of support or clarification or understanding in their life's journey. Beautiful, beautiful. And how did this work came up, came about? I mean, you, you said you have your background in osteopathy and your family were naturopaths. How did it came about for you to start to develop your own, own way of working with people and maybe viewing the work itself? It started with failure, failure in high school to learn mathematics, chemistry, and uh, physics, which meant I couldn't go to medical school, which was my distant dream. My second dream to be a pilot didn't work because of the lack of the mathematics. So I could either be a school teacher or be accepted into osteopathic school, which had lower acceptance standards than medical school. And the summer before I began osteopathic school, I worked in the family health clinic in Scotland doing massage and the assignment was from 8.30 in the morning till about 6.30 at night, one massage every half hour. So 16, 17, 18 massages a day, Swedish massage. And by the end of the um, fifth day, the end of Friday in the afternoon, the last patient came in for the, their massage and I was just exhausted. And I remember leaning back against the door of the treatment room thinking, I can't do this, feeling no energy at all. And for the first time in my life, a window or a door opened in my inner ear and I heard the words, hold his feet. So my immediate response was, well, what's going on? Am I schizophrenic? I'm hearing voices now. And a wiser part of me said, well, you don't know what else to do, so why not hold his feet? And so I held the, the patient's feet for five minutes. And then the same inner ear voice said, now hold his sacrum. So I held his sacrum. And so the session unfolded in the next half hour. And at the end of the half hour, the patient got up and said, what was that? And I said, that's what I always do. Because I had no idea what it was. And it scared me what had happened following this invisible voice. And it so scared me that I decided to not work like that anymore, not listen to voices. And at the same time, it haunted me. And for the next five years through osteopathic school, I 
look for someone I could talk to about this, some wise elder who might explain it. I was scared of being um, seen as schizophrenic or weird in some way. And only actually, what was that? Six years after that event and more events like that that unfolded, that I heard the voice of an Indian guru on a scratchy cassette tape. His name was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. At that time, later he changed his name to Osho, by which name he's commonly known today. And I thought, this guy knows, this guy. I need to go see this guy. And that was the winter of 1973. And by March, I was at his apartment in Bombay, India, and was to stay with him for 10 years. Uh, and that allowed me the space to develop this work. Mm. Does that make sense? It does make a lot of sense, definitely. And um, I like personally, like I'm just starting to learn this work, uh, just getting my feet feet sweat in it. And I really like, you know, the the honoring of the lineages. You know, like when you mm -hmm. describe things mm -hmm. that you really honor the different lineages and. And um, it feels like it's more than just craniosacral uh, work, right? It feels like it's more than what you've taught. It feels like you added all the, the different elements yeah. from all your different yeah. lineages and, and teachers. And, and that, for me, that makes it very, very unique, a very unique modality. And oh, I, don't, I don't think it's unique. I think that any good therapist or teacher evolves their own way, according to their own gifts, their own limitations, their own failures. At one point in a class in Germany, a student asked me about biodynamic craniosacral work, which is a very valuable addition to the um, tableau of, of craniosacral modalities. And after doing my best to be even-handed and describe the advantages of biodynamic work, the advantages of visionary work, the advantages of biomechanical work, the three main schools. I, I went to lie down, uh, have a siesta. I felt I hadn't done a good job. And I had a kind of dream state lying there uh, on the floor where the founder of cranial osteopathy, William Sutherland, came in to visit me. And with his wonderful piercing blue eyes and his white hair, looked at me with great kindness and said, you shouldn't try to name it none of the names are right. And I woke up with a start thinking, well, did William Sutherland really visit me or was that a fantasy? It felt like a real visit. It felt similar to the voice that, that had come to me 40 years earlier in, in Scotland when I was age 19. So it's a name and you shouldn't try to name it. None of the names are right. What's right is that the client walks in the room and the relationship begins, as Arnie Mandel says, within 20 seconds. And if the relationship's a positive one, then some form of healing or understanding occurs. And, and the name is just, well, you have to have a name, but is that what the real work is? No. The real work is seeing people in a deep way, touching them in a deep way, being responsive. To tell another story, I gave a talk in, in Spain 14 years ago, and I was a bit wary of how the translator would be because I had a bad experience with another translator. So we did a test run and he was very good. And it was an hour and he was translating in an excellent fashion. And at, at one point I said, the gifted healer has to be a chameleon. And the Spaniard translated it and the audience roared with laughter. I thought, wait a minute, that wasn't funny. Why did they laugh? And I, I stopped to ask him, what did you think I said? He said, comedian. <laughs> and I said, I can understand why they laugh. And actually, it's a good answer. A good therapist needs to be a comedian. Sometimes you need to see the humor in the events. And, but chameleon, my original meaning, you, you change color, you change shape according to who the client needs you to be. That's so, very true. To be of service. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful analogy. So what really stood out for me um, from, I had a lot of different kind of bodywork modalities throughout, throughout the years. And what I really stood out when I got exposed to this kind of work was um, the unwinding. I've had mm -hmm. similar 
experiences in other modalities, but not like this. And uh, you know, for the audience, they might not know what I mean when I say that unwinding. What what would you say to that? You know, what 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 would an experience of unwinding be, or or what is it all about? You know, why why does the body start to unwind? Let me do my best to give a practical off the cuff example. I'm walking down the street and right in front of me, there's a terrible traffic accident. And I go, oh my God, I can't look. And there's a deep trauma that settles into my field. And three years later, I see a therapist and with no awareness of why I'm doing that, I bring my hands over my face and the therapist asks, why, why are you doing that? And you say, there's something I don't want to look at. It's awful. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, it was that. It was that accident three years ago. And the therapist gently requests, can I take your hand? And I say, yeah, you can take it. And the therapist takes my hand and starts to move my hand. And at this point, I'm in a cold sweat. My heart beats increasing. My blood pressure is up. And the therapist starts to follow the what we call cranial wave, which is involuntary movement of the hand. And following is the first stage. There's no psychological, emotional, or spiritual content. You're just following the movement. And suddenly there's a secondary movement. And now I'm in my pain that it was a terrible accident and I didn't do what I should have done. I should have run to the car and helped those people in trouble, but I was so shocked I didn't look. So unwinding means there's psychological content. I was ashamed that I didn't act uh, responsibly as a human being should and run to those people's aid, I hid. So there's um, humiliation, shame, and part of the therapist's job is to say, can you see that that was instinctive? Can you forgive yourself? And slowly the process of unwinding that is following the movement facilitates the remembering of the emotion, which allows the emotion to be fully experienced, fully felt, and then let go of. So following is just the movement. Unwinding is when there's content and there's always a memory. It's not necessarily trauma. It might be great joy. When my daughter was born, the day my daughter was born, I couldn't feel all the joy. It was so joyful, but there was more joy I, I couldn't feel. And so the therapist sees me doing this with my hands and then connects to my hands and then does that help? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's uh feels like a way for the body to either complete the cycle or to get something through the system, like yeah. an expression, right? It was a bit frozen and he and he yes. wants to yeah, good word, frozen. Yeah. Locked in. Locked in. Yeah. Something's locked into my experience that needs to be unwound or opened. Yeah. I personally feel when I, the work that I've done with some, some clients is I never been so in tune with another being. And it's really like a dance sometimes, you know, you yeah. come here and the body's like, no, I want to go yeah. here. I want to go here. Yeah. And yeah. And the connection with the person was just like you said, within the first 20 seconds, you feel straight away there's a connection. But after working a little bit with the person, I can really feel this dance. And yeah, it becomes, I don't know how to say it, it becomes like a very close bond with the person. Sure, it's professional, but I can really feel we're sharing the space somehow. Um and I think that's for me, you know, was very therapeutical starting to go to sessions myself as a client because you know, they want to express emotions, they want to cry, they want to talk about certain things. And, you know, within a couple of minutes, I'm like, blah, 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 talking about my mother and talking about yeah. everything. And I'm like, how did I wind up here? <laughs> what yeah. Why am I sharing all this stuff? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ramana Maharishi, it was, I believe, who said, there is no other. Mm. The whole concept that there's another and we're separate is not a reality. Yeah. The, in the Zulu language, in Isi Zulu, they, they say, a person is a person because of other people. We're formed in the social context. Our whole psychology is formed in the social context and 
And yet there's that place we can go to where there is no other. We're just one field. That's amazing. And when it comes to like, um, there's a term or there's a there's something that's been coming back as I've been doing this work and studying, it's that touching the soul, right? That it's like you touch the soul and you really connect on that level. What would you say that's about? Is it, I mean, there's one level of I'm working with the Svinoi, there's one level of I'm actually seeing another person. But what would you say the aspect of that is in this in this um, realm that we're working with? Aspects of the word. In Aspect. The cosmology I'm comfortable with, largely formed by my 10 years in India. The soul is external to the physical body, but inside the energy field. And the energy field or bioelectric field is the spirit. The spirit is a field of intelligence and information that fluctuates. And in craniosacral terms, that the fluctuation is called flexion and extension. The soul being inside that energy field, however, is something that isn't born, doesn't die, and is unique to that person and is a kind of enlightened consciousness that usually doesn't judge the person, that loves them unconditionally, and yet has certain qualities. The quality, for instance, of a good mother or a good father, the quality of a good teacher or a good a technician or a good soccer player and when a person's life journey is in high degree of alignment with their soul they tend to be healthy happy radiant and when they lose contact with their soul they tend to be depressed uh, unhealthy and certainly not luminous so in my way of working and way of teaching we seek to access the client's soul, understanding that it's just there above their left shoulder, above the crown of their head, and talk to their soul and understand their soul and their soul's needs and relay that information to the client. It's, a, it's intuitive reading or psychic work. It's the esoteric part of osteopathy it was practiced extensively by osteopathy's founder, Andrew Taylor Still who himself was taught by the Shawnee, the Native Americans of Missouri. So I, as therapist, am the conduit or channel between the client's soul and the client's consciousness. I'm saying, you know, I hear this from your soul. I hear that you've fallen down a hole in the road and you need someone to help you bring you up out of this hole so you can see clearly again. Does that make any sense to you? And they say, oh, yeah. I can even tell you the day I fell down the hole. And, and so a conversation can begin and they say later, I'm so glad you saw me falling down that hole because no one else did and I felt it and it enables me to climb out of it. So you're being a facilitator of their process. And my brother, who's a professor of psychology, doesn't believe in the soul's existence. So he won't accept my rationale. But most people do, and most people experience it, and it works, and so we have busy practices. That's amazing. That's really wonderful to hear. In, in other words, you need to find the client's language, and if soul and spirit don't work for them, you find what does work. Yeah, because everyone has a reference of what that means you know, for yeah. you, and they might just name it differently depending on where you come yeah. from and yeah. background. And yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, definitely. So who would you say would benefit from this, right? If I'm listening to this and, and like, okay, why, why, why should, what would be a common reason or symptoms that people have when they come and look for this kind of work? The most spectacular, obvious benefits are working with children. Mm. Starting from day one after birth, if the birth was difficult or traumatic, because at birth, the cranium has no sutures. The individual bones of the cranium are free to, to slip and, and be in an inappropriate location because of the enormous pressures of going through the mother's birth canal. And 
a 20 minute skillful application of hands to the, the little child's head can change the whole rest of their life. So I believe it's the Bible that says, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. Here's a child newly born, if they're bent and you straighten them on the first day, the rest of their life, they're straight, they're no longer bent. Who else benefits people with the kind of middle level medical conditions that can be so painful, such as migraine or cluster headaches, low back pain, concussion, whiplash injury, shoulder arm hand syndrome where there's radiating pain down the arms, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction where there's, there's pain in the TMJs and it can be acutely painful. And when we're lost and we need someone to help us find our way back to our uh, straight and narrow path or our winding path as the case may be. Beautiful. And you mentioned the work with the brain, if I'm, if I got it right, with the concussions and the migraines. But of course, there's more layers than just the brain when when it comes to pain. But uh, I, as I've seen, there's a lot of work we do with the brain in this modality. How would you explain that? Well, what is it that actually happens to the brain when you're when you're uh, yeah working in this manner? Simply put. I believe it, Albert Einstein put it this way, people like us who believe in physics know that the idea of past and present is nothing but a persistent illusion. And that we have certain ideas which are illusory, one of which is somehow that the position and movement of the brain is not important. We know physiologically the brain moves with every heartbeat, it moves with every breath, Hard to prove scientifically, it moves with every cranial wave, but some people watching open brain surgery attest having seen cranial wave of the brain. And my sense of what we're really doing when we're laying on hands in a craniosacral session is we're optimizing position, the cranial wave, and the energy field of the brain. Cranial bones matter. Without bones, our brain wouldn't be protected. Without bones, Muscles would have nowhere to anchor to without bones. There'd be no place for joints. But who's really important? The brain. Cranial nerves, spinal cord. So what's going on when you treat a newborn child with a deflection of a, a parietal bone? You're optimizing the parietal bone, bringing it back, which may have put some pressure on the brain. And then you optimize the child's brain position, wave, field. And that can be a complete healing on the first day of life. After an automobile accident where there's been a severe impact and maybe a, a whiplash and maybe a concussion as well, then in essence, you're bringing the brain back to a healthy, normal position and cranial wave and energy field. And that's in a way as foreign to Western medicine as... Uh, uh, the, the whole field that Albert Einstein was trying to put into words, that there's something else here that is deeper than common understanding. That time and space don't exist in our normal way of understanding it. The energy field manifests symptoms in ways that our ordinary understanding of health does not usually accommodate. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, or I heard you mention earlier about the sphenoid and touching the sphenoid and spirit and soul. When the yogis of India were first exposed to the Christian Bible, they read something Jesus is reported to have said, when then I be single, thine whole body be filled with light. And the Kriya yogi said, ah, a yogi of the inner eye, a yogi of Ajna. And so they called the sphenoid the bone of Christ consciousness. If thine eye be single, thine whole body be filled with light. There's light within a woman of light, and if she shares her light, she illuminates her whole world. If she does not shine, she is darkness. So what are we doing? We're optimizing the place of light, of perception, of a man or woman's ability to share their light with the world. When they don't share it, they are darkness, they are depressed. 
So it's that cosmology, Arno Mandel called it dream body, that when we touch the Srinod, we touch the spirit, we affect the soul. And if those words don't work for you or I, we have to find different words. Yeah, definitely. Follow, follow the organism, follow the person that comes in. Yes. And, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes. This is a journey. Yeah. Um, similar to the heart, um, would the brain work like that's that's something that I noticed a lot um, in one of the trainings. They talk a lot about the heart and. Nowadays, with modern science, people are catching up that there is a lot of neurons. The cells of the heart is neurons. They're not just muscular cell tissue, right? They can actually send and receive information. But I felt this kind of work of, 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 of touching the heart was very, very different from anything else that I had. I had Reiki. I had a lot of different kind of um, healing, but not really like this. You know, that the, it felt like the heart was yeah, talking. So it's like someone is shy that starts to come out of its shell and, and, and moving and talking. And what would you say to that? You know, what would what what is it that actually happens in, in your words when when someone's getting touched like that and, and connect to the heart? I salute you for saying it so well. I think that is what happens. That the heart does have his or her voice and sometimes speaks directly to the owner when we get a message from our heart. Sometimes it requires the practitioner or therapist to hear the message and relay it to the person. And so in the Hindu and ancient Egyptian cosmology of seven chakras or seven souls, each place has its own voice. Almost like they are our seven children and they all want to be heard and listened to and taken care of. In the cosmology of visionary work, we have simple truisms, one of which is you can't get the head right if the heart isn't right, and you can't get the heart right if the sacrum isn't right. So those are our three primary centers. And they all have voices. Yeah, and there seems to be a lot of different philosophies talking about the same thing. It's similar to the traditional Chinese medicine, the Tantians as well, right? That you have the different centers that need to align and yeah. for us to be aware and, and yeah, and, and be aligned, I say. I believe that Zen Buddhism says the three Dantian are the inner eye, the heart, and the hara, and which is very close to you can't get the head right if the heart isn't right. You can't get the heart right if the second is right. It's the same cosmology. No. It's a different cosmology, but the same essence. Like you said, different ways of explaining it. Yeah. They found their words of explaining it, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's beautiful put. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my background uh, from martial arts, from Japanese martial arts. So in, in your trainings, when you talk a lot about uh, the shokuntasa, the spatial awareness, so I can recognize a lot of those words from martial applications, not just for healing works. Um, is there any of that essence in in this work, or did you learn more healing works, or have you done any any martial forms that you you have added on into this way of working with people? When I arrived in India in 1973, I had a very difficult first 18 months or so with the guru, with the man now called Osho, and at, at some point. He said something that was very difficult for me to hear. And through sitting with my grandmother, who'd had a stroke and wasn't able to speak, I learned how to hear people's inner voices, even though they couldn't speak. And I heard his inner voice and repeated exactly what I heard back to him. And he made a little startled because I was doing what he could do. And our relationship changed. And shortly after that, he made me his bodyguard slash personal assistant. And for the next seven years, I had what was in effect a, an apprenticeship. I served him by keeping him safe and helping him with his daily assignments. And he gave me this wonderful induction into what I would today call visionary work. 
he worked seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. He did a 90 minute lecture in the morning a 90 minute darshan in the evening. And I'd never seen anything like it. He perceived people so swiftly, so deeply that uh, it astonished me. And it was precisely the kind of energy that had come upon me when I was 19 and had that first visionary experience when I was exhausted. And as part of that, I started training in the martial arts. We were lucky enough to have a young man who'd just come in from Okinawa, he was a second Dan Black Belt in, in Wado Rio, the way of harmony. And so for about seven years, I trained two to three hours a day in karate. We did some Aikido. We had uh, a wonderful fascination with Bushido. And so uh, part of the emphasis of the training, the Shunkuntasa, the undifferentiated awareness, which is a samurai battlefield technique from medieval days. You didn't live long on a battlefield if you didn't know what was happening behind you 300 years ago. And the art of a bodyguard is to see someone who's potentially hostile from 100 meters away. If you wait till they're one meter away from the man you're trying to protect, it's too late. Because as I'm sure you know, you can't predict what will happen in a fight. Everything happens so fast. And uh, so you need to see it. You need to see the threat 100 meters or more away. And part of my experience was slowly discovering that I could do that. It wasn't conscious. I just realized I kept looking at someone. And over the re years, realized if I keep looking, that this person is a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. And that evolved from martial arts, from being bodyguard, into therapy work of my eyes being drawn to a certain part of someone's body, having no idea why, touching that part, and then saying, oh, yeah, that's where my trouble is. So in in terms of the Hindu mythology, that's Ajna, that's inner eye, perceiving what people need, perceiving what troubles people. And I think it's a universal human gift. I don't think that any one person uh, doesn't have that ability. But whether they allow it, whether they train it, whether they use it, that determines if they're skilled as a visionary or a bodyguard or a race car driver for that matter. Yeah, the ability to see, right? To use yeah. all your senses to see. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm really glad I came across this, uh, although you don't want to put a name on it, which I understand, but this <laughs> this way of, of uh, <laughs> viewing, this way of interacting with people, this way of touching, being touched, uh, really for me it's felt like a lot of different disciplines come together in one and i've always yeah. been feeling like oh i have to study this and this and that and this really feels like an honoring of a lot of lineages and knowledge and it feels very comprehensive but like you said it's not a strict form or a strict style it's you can build on it you can yes kind of turn it into your own uh, as I feel everyone should. Oh, one more time? Sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> as I feel everyone should. In other words, you, you take a training, you graduate from your training, and then you slowly evolve that according to your personal gifts and, and very much according to the people that come to you. So in my experience, our practices are formed by our clients. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah yeah it, and that's a big part of what we do here as well we call it follow the organism that we you have an idea and intention of what to do but you can formulate it intellectually you have to see what's going on and, and work with that system otherwise yeah. you're having a tug of war and no one's going to really win if you try to force someone into a certain style yeah. oh okay I like, your, I like your words and see what's happening yeah yeah, yeah. See what's yeah, see what comes up, see what comes out yeah. of it. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so if anyone's heard this program and, and want to get to know your work or maybe even learn, there is a there's a training program that you have. Where where would they go? How would they uh find more about 
They go to www.milneinstitute.com. So that's Mike, India, Lima, November, Echo, and then the word institute.com. And there's a German language side, has a little German flag at the top, and an English language side has the British Union Jack at the top. And you'll see our classes worldwide. The nearest to you in Thailand is Australia. Most of our classes are in Europe and North America. And uh, if a person's interested, goes to the website. The, on the header line, they can see classes, schedules, practitioners, and, and learn about the program. It's a minimum two years. They need a, if they wish to take the training, they need the minimum of 150 hour massage training licensure they need to be licensed to touch and maximum of 10 years and i think we have something like close to a thousand graduates worldwide still in practice yeah go to the website oh that's amazing yeah and it feels like steps each steps feels very different it doesn't feel like a traditional linear training it's uh, really what you said you know it's about developing your own skills and honoring what you already have and, and learning how to use that with others that's that's the sensation i got so far and i'm only in the beginning so it might change as i go go along it's a pay as you go so you take your first class it's called c1 or cranial one it's four days pay for it, take it, and then you decide if it's for you. And if you do, you can go on to the next class, a C2, you pay for it, and then you decide. And typically of 100 people that start at the C1, about 20 graduate. The others, at some point, we never see again, they decide it's not for them, they take a different path. And that feels healthy and normal. That doesn't work for some people. And it's quite a rigorous and demanding training. They have to practice. They have to have supervisions. They have to have reviews. They have to do test sessions with teachers. Yeah. And we yeah. know it works. Yeah. And once again, it reminds me of this uh, master student kind of setting. You, you learn like the traditional osteopathy trainings, right? That you... You went into the office and you learned with them for several hours. It was not necessarily just reading a book. You learned in doing the work hands on. Yeah. Yeah. And including challenges of perception, for instance, getting a sense of a client's soul or listening to what their heart has to say. So it's multi dimensional. Beautiful, beautiful. Do you have anything, any last words, anything you want to add that we haven't talked about or? That we haven't brushed upon today. I am remembering a moment I had at a cocktail party when a man who seemed armored and um, egotistical and big, strong American man, and it was the polite formality of a cocktail party in an expensive part of town. And he said, Hi, what do you do? And I said, I do interiors. And suddenly he kind of softened and his eyes changed and he looked at me in a different way and he kind of put his head to one side and said, yeah, I can see you do. And I think that's one of the best explanations because that's what we, are, we do. We work with people's interiors. And all the words like osteopathy or, or rolfing or deep tissue or bioenergetics are not quite as truthful as I work with interiors. This is what we do, you and I. Oh, that's beautifully put, definitely. I really like those philosophical aspects of it. it. It's very easy to get caught up in a spoken word or this is a rule, but when you use philosophy, yeah, it really allows for a different interpretation. You make your own out of it. Yeah, there it is. Well, Thank you very much for this. It's been, been a pleasure having you here. And been a pleasure, Simba. Uh, hopefully I will see more from you in the future. <laughs> Traveling. And maybe meet in person. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And give my regards to Frances and thank her for 
introducing us. I will do for sure, for sure. <laughs> Thanks, and, bye bye.